So, um, for the um, special end part of our morning session, morning session, here it is. Every four years, something special happens in the summer on a global sporting scale. Joining by video link from London will be Jackie Brooke Taylor, Director of Communications and Public Affairs at the London 2012 Organising Committee for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. At the Games of the 30th Olympiad in 2012 are awarded to the city of London. First, we want to deliver a magical experience, an electrifying atmosphere for competitors and spectators. The atmosphere is going to be electric. You will remember it for the rest of your life. Yay! And that magic begins with the venues, existing world-class venues, spectacular city centre locations, and most importantly, our decision to create an Olympic Park. It's just a fantastic thing to see the transformation. Gives me goosebumps, you know. There will be a fantastic atmosphere here. Yeah. It's enormous when you actually hear you in awe of the size of the whole complex. What a beautiful, inspiring building it is. It's inspiring people to give it a go, to get out there and, and have fun. We know the Games must offer more than just 17 days of world-class sport and celebration. Wow, London's amazing. London's vision is to reach young people all around the world. To inspire young people to choose sport wherever they live, whatever they do, whatever they believe. In 1948, our predecessors reunited a devastated world through sport. And their legacy was the first volunteer program. Delegates, let's please give Jackie a warm summit welcome from Dublin. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Some thumbs up if you can. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk. Um, I have to say, when you suggested that I present to you by video link, um, at first, all I could think of, for those of you that are UK-based, um, all I could think about was a scene from the BBC a satirical sort of parody of the Organising Committee 2012. Um, and if anyone has seen that moment, it was just an entire... Um, rather hysterical moment of trying to join people from around the world onto a, a single video conference. Hopefully we won't um, be that bad going forward. Um, we have 43 days to go until the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. That means six Thursdays left to go, which is um, a sobering thought, obviously. Um, but I'd like to talk to you today about three elements of the Games. One is the scale of the Games. And why that's important is that it will show you why the measurement um, uh, criteria that we used had to be the way it, the way it is and, it, and the, the way we're doing it. Secondly, a little bit around the communication strategy and how we have developed that and used that over the last uh, seven years. And then lastly, a little bit around the measurement. I mean, clearly the project is not finished yet, but we can give you a little bit about how we have measured our sort of progress over the last seven years. So if we go to the next slide, I want to talk literally about the, the scale. 
Um, many of you, I think, have probably been involved in games, whether it's from a, an organizing committee or from a partner perspective. But essentially, we host 46 World Championships, 26 Olympic, 20 Paralympic, all taking place simultaneously over 30 days. So it is a very, very long period of time uh, that, we, that, that, that we are running the Games. There are 15,000 elite athletes, um, more, I think they're from 104 countries for the Olympic Games and 190-odd um, countries for the Paralympic Games. Um, that's more members than the United Nations has. So uh, all of those athletes are fighting for around 4,000 medals. Um, most intense competition on the planet, officials that... Uh, officiate at each of those sporting events. There's around 5,000 of those. Uh, we have a workforce that is made up of staff, volunteers and contractors of around 200,000 people. Um, and we have 11 million ticket holders that will be watching both the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. Um, and then on top of all of that, we have over 20,000 accredited media that arrive in London, probably around another 10,000 non-accredited media that will also come to London really for the colour. And, uh, you know, it, it is the probably the biggest thing happening on the planet at the time it happens. Um, and uh, if you actually held all those sports events that I mentioned earlier on consecutive days, the Games would actually end in October 2013. So we're not planning to do that, which is great. But um, I'd like to really talk a little bit about the sort of communication uh, sort of challenge. Uh, so if we look at the next slide, it's not just about um, the media who will be there and the mass photographers, but I've been involved, I think the first games I was involved in goes way back, but the first games I was involved in in a serious capacity was in Sydney uh, for the 2000 games. And those games, if you wanted a ticket, you had to fill in a form. They, we put ticket brochures uh, in a national newspaper that was sent all over the country, and you had to post your applications back to us on paper. Um, in fact, I remember at the very end of the ticketing um, process in Sydney, we thought we were doing something pretty groundbreaking when we decided, as well as box office, we'll actually sell some of the tickets online. And it was. It was pretty cutting edge back in 2000. Um, then I think there were roughly about 250 million Internet users, very few having access to fast broadband um, or connection. There are now well over 2 billion Internet users, as you all know. Facebook was launched only a few months before Athens 2004, so fairly new phenomena, and it only began to reach outside the sort of American university campus, again, as you probably all know, um, shortly after that. Um, and Twitter, Beijing, you know, Twitter really uh, started um, just around the Beijing Games, probably not much of it in Beijing and in China, um, but now we kind of went from sort of 300,000 tweets a day to something like 340 million tweets. Um, so massive, massive change in how people communicate, how people share information, how people are going to actually um, enjoy the games and how they're going to work, uh, or how they're going to, um, uh, you know, use the games and share information. So, I think one of the biggest, um, so certainly a stat that we like to use here, is that one of the biggest online events in 2011 was actually the Women's Football World Cup between the USA and Japan. So more than 7,000 tweets were sent every single second, um, more than any other sports event last year, even bigger than the Japanese earthquake or the death of Osama bin Laden. And I think even President Obama sent 13 tweets about the match. So that was just last year, um, and we expect over the 26 sports we have for the Olympics and the 20 we have for the Paralympics that this will have increased immeasurably um, uh, when it comes to us hosting in about a month's time. Um, the, what I want to sort of look at, I mean, I think if we look at the um, way people will consume the games, um, again, with the uh, advent of social media, uh, I think we will end up in a situation where people will use their own experiences, share their own images and their own experiences probably more than they will be consuming official information through rights-holding broadcasters, accredited media. So I think this is one of the new 
a sort of phenomenon that that uh, we will be facing as we move on to uh, you know move on to our games in, in in the next month. And with that comes a whole range of challenges. You know, access to you know uh, Wi-Fi and all sorts of uh, other um, situations in and around each of our venues. Um, so that just kind of looks at the scale of the challenge from 10 years ago, 12 years ago in Sydney through to where we are here in, um, in 2012. Can I talk a little bit about our comms strategy? Then I'm going to talk about the measurement and then open it up for questions because there's always loads more questions than I can ever get through in a presentation. So I want to make sure we've got time for that. So on the next slide, one of the challenges you have when you start on a um, journey with a uh, organizing committee is how to maintain excitement, interest, uh, involvement over the seven year period. Now, I have been involved in the London Games actually from the very outset from the bid back in uh, May 2009. So working through the bid process um, and then changing tack and working through how we're going to deliver the communications across seven years is uh, something that was a challenge. We did something that um, I thought would be, it was, was useful, which is we managed to put our entire communication strategy on one page. You have a copy of it there in front of you for 2012. As a formula and as a structure, it actually hasn't changed over the four years. And if you can bear with me for a few minutes, I'll explain that slide in front of you. So there are three uh, core parts of our communication strategy. Starting from the bottom, in this case, we have uh, what we call brilliant basics. And right across the project for the last seven years, we have identified each year what the core basics are that we have to deliver. And we call it the drumbeat of progress, really, from the building of the venues to um, the work that we were doing in raising the money and staging the games, the work that our partners were doing in uh, creating a lot of the uh, transport, the security, and all of the other core components, and also the work that the British Olympic Association and the British Paralympic Association, along with UK Sport here in the UK, were doing to get the athletes ready. So it's sort of the drumbeat of progress. Every year, we identified exactly what they would, what they would be. We announced what we wanted to be judged on um, at the beginning of the year, and we consistently told everybody what we were doing. We told them again when we were doing it. We told them again when we had done it. And just for good measure, we probably told them again at the end um, of the year, uh, collectively, what we had achieved. And when you have a project the scale and size of the Olympic Games, this is really um, critical because every little nuance can be mis um, sort of or can be misunderstood, put out of context, um, a whole range of different things. So p being able to really articulate over seven years what you need to accomplish in each of those years is um, clearly critical to making sure that the public mood um, uh, is, uh, you know, is always with you. That's the bottom half, sort of bringing, the top half of it is the bit in pink, uh, which is bringing the games to life. And what you'll see there is each year we really identified um, four key moments in the year where we would try and combine and bring together the uh, media, all of our stakeholders, the public, um, both in the UK and internationally, to sit around some of the big moments. So each year they would be for different things that we would do. Now, lots of other announcements were made, hence the other little stars that were in there, but actually the real focus that we were able to bring to this was that each and every time we did something big around each of those four moments, we saw a significant shift in public views and public attitudes, and that ended up being a um, pretty solid strategy. And as I'll come on to later, when you're creating an, sort of a whole communications uh, and marketing plan without much advertising, and certainly no television advertising, uh, you really needed to make sure, and we needed to make sure, that we had things that would have proper cut through um, and didn't just sort of dissipate because there were so many bits and pieces around it. In the middle, actually just before I go, the yellow stars, we introduced this really, um, the, the three yellow stars this year. They haven't been um, in the strategy for the last uh, six years. Um, and that was, to, again, to really try and focus 
media, stakeholders, public around core countdown days. Um, I think you, we've worked out countdown days for almost everything. I think we even do know when 2012 hours uh, was to the Games and to the Paralympic Games, etc. So what we wanted to do is to say, let's focus on some key countdown days uh, where Again, the media can get behind it. People can, you know, put some significant energies. And when you've got a sort of live construction site that is the centerpiece of your games, as we do with the Olympic Park, again, it's a very effective way of making sure that you don't disrupt what is a massive building and overlay program with hundreds and hundreds of things. You can actually corral people uh, behind key days and key dates. Um, so that, is, uh, th that was that bit of it. Now, the bit in the middle um, came about from, I, was, I did some work with the Manchester Commonwealth Games, and one of the things, I came in fairly late on that, and one of the things that I presented to the board when they said, well, what's your communication um, strategy for the Games? And this was about six weeks out from the Games. Um, and I said, well, actually, answer me one question. What do you want the Games to be remembered for? And other than, I think we got some sort of sarcastic type remarks like, oh, that it doesn't rain all the time in Manchester. Um, they were, hadn't really thought through exactly what they wanted the Games to remember, what, what they wanted the Games to be remembered for. So one of the things we set out very, very early, again, um, over, over six years ago, now um, was what do we want the world to remember? Now these won't be um, alien to you because you've just watched the film. Four of them are the core pillars of what we promised that we would deliver if we won the right to host the games when we bid, um, and that is youth and young people. Uh, it's about transformation. I think uh, during the bid we called it regeneration, but given where we are now, it really is a very transformed part of London. Um, Sports and athletes at the very heart of everything we do, very, very important because we um, said during the bid and we have said consistently over the last six years that actually you have to have a well-stocked shop window. You have to have good role models um, for young people to want to follow in the footsteps of athletes. And then the other one we, we talked about in the bid was that what a great place London was. Not, not only was it a great diverse city, it was a big city, it was an iconic city. People all over the world had links, whether they were, you know, sort of from sort of uh, Charles Dickens' books through to people who had actually been here. There is, a, there is an understanding um, and a link with uh, what people expect London to be like. The fifth one we added was really about people and this comes to the heart of the vision that we set at the very outset which was that we wanted everyone to be involved and we wanted the whole of the UK to feel that they could engage and be involved and we wanted people from around the world to feel that they could be in, they could engage and be involved in the London Games and that's clearly not just volunteering and torch relays and tickets because there would never be enough of any of those opportunities but it was about creating opportunities for them so every press release we've ever written every speech we've ever done every film we've ever done not every photo unfortunately is tagged back to one of those five themes so that all through um, and over the last sort of six and a half years seven years we've been able to uh, dial up or dial down um, areas of that strategy where we feel that sometimes that story may not be getting across in the uh, in, in the way we want. So that is the sort of communication uh, plan on a single sheet of paper um, that we've been following for the for the for the last six seven years. And when I talk about that communications plan, it actually is a combined um, communications plan. It, I sit as a director and chair the Director of Communications Forum here in London, and it consists of the Director of Communications for the you know, main government department, the Mayor of London, the British Olympic Association, and the British Paralympic Association, um, as well as transport and security. So we have the core Director of Comms across the project and the core delivery partners, and we've been together as a group for seven years. And... Uh, this is, it, it, this is a joint development. So this isn't just a organizing committee comms plan. It's actually a comms plan that works right across the project. And that has been critical in making sure that we don't end up sort of saturating the market with a zillion different um, stories and uh, uh, 
photos and information. So it's it's worked really well across it. It's well, it's backed up by a kind of comms plan that we present and we report into the Olympic board. And behind that sits a sort of day by day grid of stories um, and uh, activities that we're all doing. So that I just thought would be sort of a useful look at how we have um, managed or the strategy of behind our communications um, uh, over the last seven years. Um, and the last section I want to talk about really is measurement. So on the next slide, um, there's a series of slides that sort of look at, this is the bid, and many of you will recognize this image um, of uh, sort of Kelly after the announcement was made that London had won the right. Um, and if we look at most of what we track back to, most of what we measure is the promises we made in Singapore that made people vote for us. And in the bid, it was easy. Um, well, it seemed, it seemed hard at the time, but it actually was a relatively easy task, which was we had to win it. So what was your success criteria? Well, winning uh, was clearly it. Um, and we had to convince just over 100 um, individuals to vote for London over any of the other cities. They sort of call it the great perfume race, I think, because of all of the great cities from sort of Paris, New York, Moscow, Madrid, London, um, that competed for that. And we only just won, and it is kind of important to remember that, and we always remember that. Um, we only won by four votes, um, but when we did, and what we then had to do was to change our communication from a very, very targeted, focused um, piece of communication, which was easily measured, um, right through to uh, how are we going to create a communications plan uh, that will take us right through seven years. Um, so if we uh, move on to the next slide, the core component of this was actually creating a strong vision. And the vision, again, no surprise to anybody that's been following um, our games, but we wanted to use the power of sport to create lasting change. Very, very important. You know, we won the bid on the promise that London, of all the cities that were um, bidding, would have the biggest impact and the biggest attraction to young people and what we could do in and around um, young people. So establishing that vision early was um, critical. And that's why, as you saw early, one of the key platforms for us was about young people. And it helped us then create a set of core products, uh, for want of a better word, that allowed us to deliver that. So those were things like a massive schools program in and around the UK. Um, and I think something like 80 odd percent of the schools have now signed up to um, the, uh, the, the schools program. And that's been going probably for five, for five years. It took a couple of years to set up. Um, but a huge um, program and a huge investment of our um, time in, in, in delivering that. Um, also international inspiration, which was the international uh, program that we wanted, where we wanted to get uh, 20 million um, young people from 12 million countries uh, to start uh, or to be involved in a sports project. Some of them are about coaching, some of them are about Bangladesh, for example, has a fantastic program of where they teach young uh, kids to swim. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of children every year die um, from the floods because they're unable to swim. So we've looked at programs that really mean something. It's not a sort of one-size-fits-all program, but are very, very tailored programs that we've done a lot of work uh, with the British Council and UK Sport on that create um, lasting programs and lasting legacy. And, you know, the great thing is we've beaten that target. Um, so, again, an easy measure for us. Um, and we uh, are continuing to grow that program. And it will have a life afterwards, which, again, is a uh, terrific thing. So, young people, very, very important. It helps us really define where we should put a great deal of our effort. And also the government. I mean, the government has put a big uh, lump of effort and time into uh, looking at young people, looking at uh, encouraging more young people to take up sport, sport, sport participation, um, and they've recently had their first um, youth game, sort of youth games and school games that were held in the stadium. So again, a big you know focus for the whole project. On the um, for the next slide, the other we had quite a, 
audacious vision too. So in using the power of sport to inspire lasting change is fine in itself, but actually we wanted these to be everyone's games. And that was a massive challenge. The International Olympic Committee presents a games to a city, not a country. Um, so how to engage everybody it was, was really important for us. And again, we spent a huge amount of time and effort creating uh, projects and um, uh, concepts that would engage the whole of the UK so they would feel they would be involved. You know, as we've said before, um, you can't give enough tickets or sell enough tickets to people who want them. You really do have to um, uh, find different ways for people to join in. So we set up an Inspire program, which was the way that communities and projects all over the UK could become involved in uh, in the games and um, there are hundreds of thousands of them that have been awarded the inspire mark um, across the seven years and that program has you know been a huge a huge success we also looked at the uh, you know creating a festival cultural olympiad and a london 2012 festival where 10 million tickets will uh, be uh, handed out to people free during the games again another opportunity for people who don't necessarily uh, love sport, but really want to be involved and want to be inspired by by the game. So, creating something that was really about everyone's games um, meant um, that we had to look at some very stringent and quite hard pressing uh, measurement criteria. So, for us, that was about awareness. It was about competence. It was about connectivity to the games we measured pride and also participation so a huge part of our measurement for um, the organizing committee was number one could we raise the money I mean we had two billion pounds worth of private funding to raise um, and that was the very first kind of KPI for us um, easily measurable um, and we are only a few hundred away from raising that money um, and then the other the other areas were awareness of the games and by awareness it's not just do you know the games are happening as you would imagine that's kind of right up there in the 80 to 90 percent but support for the games and do you support the games coming here and we have enjoyed a great um, consistency of support over the last seven years and this has been something we have tracked uh, from the very beginning in fact we use the same tracking devices that we had in the bid to continue tracking um, through to through the games and our um, support for the games hasn't wavered much below about 60 percent so you know we've sort of enjoyed that level of support which of course is when you kind of put that into real numbers of people sort of sits between the 30 and 40 million people in the UK, all of our research primarily is based around um, the UK. And within that 30 to 40 million, there are 5 million uh, people. And we've seen this grow year on year from sort of zero, obviously at the beginning, or very, well, very low, it wasn't quite zero, at the very beginning through to about 5 million people who would count themselves as, as advocates for the games. And um, making and measuring that has been uh, really very um, important for us. Um, on the next slide, one of the other areas that we looked at was really around the channels we had and how we would spend our uh, sort of sh small amount of pounds really. I said at the beginning we had no real big bucks for advertising. We did. We have done some advertising. It's been primarily um, based around a VIK sponsor. So it has been a bus side, some bus shelters and also some big sort of um, outdoor um, advertising. No TV, um, most of the radio work that we've done has been based around um, sort of communications and, uh, and PR. So the channels we really had available to us were sort of traditional PR channels of media, um, social media and how we would uh, use that. It wasn't just about how we're going to embrace and manage it, it was really how can we use social media to engage people, particularly young people, in a really, really different way than has been done before. So the, la the next slide, sorry, just zooming through, um, 
uh, is worldwide. I'm not going to focus too much on this. As I said earlier, a big chunk of our international program has been around um, international inspiration, which was about getting um, the, the 20 million children in 12, in 12 countries um, involved in uh, sport of some description. And we work very closely with the, international, with the National Olympic Committees in each of those countries. They have a range of build-up to the Games, as you would imagine, with their own athletes. You would have seen a, num a number of uh, programs and uh, stunts and activities in each of your own countries as we build up. But again, we shared with all of the National Olympic Committees and also the big international media around the world some of the, the, all of those key milestones. So, you know, when we had one year to go last year, there was, you know, big noise that was done, you know, in Japan and in Australia, uh, in China for 100 days to go. The U.S. did, a, you know, an amazing sort of um, activity in uh, Times Square. So lots of them have come in behind all this. And again, important really to maximize your uh, sort of small amount of budget that you have um, going across all of this. Um, and then next slide um, is uh, really, I think the, I suppose the next thing I really wanted to, to talk about was how we measured across core assets. So we had probably three core assets that um, we, that, that we have, the tickets, torch relay, and volunteering. And again, we set measurements, you know, we needed to get 70,000 volunteers quarter of a million volunteers applied or you know applied to be a quarter of a million people applied to be volunteers massive massive um, demand and our and we measure our retention rates um, and we will continue to do that um, as we get in really close to the games and obviously through the games but compared to other games this is you know the, the this is good you know when you've got to pull that size you really have got the best the best of the best to uh, choose from torch Relay runners, we have 8,000 uh, of those, uh, 2,000 of them are the organizing committees, the others are made up of various sponsors and partners, and over 30,000 um, inspiring people um, were nominated to run with the torch. So again, it was kind of off the scale of what we were anticipating. And then tickets, which I'm sure all of you know about, um, is again, another massive demand. In the first round of tickets and the ticket ballot, 1.9 million people applied for 23 million Olympic tickets. We only had 6 million to sell. So again, on a sort of scale of measurement, it was relatively um, straightforward for us to, uh, you know, to measure the success um, or not. And yet there is massive disappointment with people who weren't able to get the tickets uh, they wanted, but uh, they, you know, they will. Uh, uh, there's the, the still opportunities; people can still buy them. Um, but we will never have had. We never have had enough tickets to uh, to uh, yeah, for everybody to share. The la next couple of slides, if we can scoot through them very quickly, really is how we've used new media to engage. And I, I, I'm very conscious I'm running out of time. So, just very quickly, um, we do create very again linked to our milestones and linked to that very first strategy I showed you. Um, we have, uh, you know, created things that people can do all over the world on social media. At Games Time, as the next slide will show, we have a very comprehensive app that will link people all over the world to the games. There will be two apps. This one is the one we call um, Join In, which will tell people what's on and where all over the country. And, you know, this is particularly important for people in the UK. Uh, we have 42 live sites all over the country. We have all sorts of events that will be going on around each of uh, those live sites. So most people around the UK are not too far away from something they can become involved in. And 57 million people in the UK are only an hour's drive from the torch relay. Um, and we have seen people come out in their sort of floods. We're on about day 24, I think, um, or day, is it 24, 26 or something. And we've got three, about three million people have already come out to see the torch and support uh, the torch as we go, which is uh, demonstrated on the next slide. Um, the sort of thousands of people that are out and supporting their local heroes and everybody who clearly are enjoying running with the flame. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention really was, given that so much of our communications has been based around traditional PR channels, um, 
if you like. It's interesting. I can't give a total figure on this because it would mean going through every single invoice or clipping we've had. But what we've anticipated, what we've looked at, we think we've probably had something like quarter of a million UK print articles written, um, and we've had around 50,000 print articles in the UK written since one year to go. Now, obviously, following traditional methods of evaluating that is just out out of, you know, off the scale of difficult to do. Um, so we don't, and we do focus all of our research, so all of our measurement on the research criteria around sort of competency, uh, connectivity, pride in the games, and also things like value for money. I mean, clearly people want, and as close as you get to the games, they really want to understand what the legacy is and how the money, particularly the government part of the money, has been spent and how it will be amortized over the, uh, over the years. So for us, the big part of this is uh, really measuring uh, the research and monitoring the tracking research that we do. That's it from me. Sorry, I have run over time. That's fine. Can you hear me okay? I can. Excellent. Thank you for that. I'm going to go straight into questions, Jackie. Um, so, who has the first question? Please identify yourself by name, please. Uh, Jackie, I'm Jeremy Thompson from Gorkana in London. Uh, thank you very much for that. We actually ran a, an event uh, back in April with Joanna Manning Cooper, um, your, uh, your head of PR. We ran a, an event on the comms countdown, and it was, um, the event was for a room full of PRs explaining how they, could, how they and their clients could still get involved with um, uh, with the games and it was, it was extremely well received and it was the moment that I think I personally started to engage with the games because uh, some of the slides you used today and some of the stats uh, that you, you spoke to came out at that event and I, I was fascinated by the scale of it. Um, I've got my tickets, I'm a proud Londoner and uh, I cannot, cannot wait. Um, and I hope it stops raining before then because uh, uh, for those of you who have been to London the last few weeks it's, uh, it's not summer there yet. My question though for you is it's the second time in a row that we've hosted the Games at a time of great austerity. Um, 1948, uh, there was an article actually in The Economist uh, last week about the challenges back in 1948. And some of them are not dissimilar to the challenges we have today. And I, I suspect you've had particular challenges um, in uh, communicating uh, the Games, the benefit of the Games, the people of London, the people of the UK. Um, in the face of you know, great hardship, uh, high unemployment, um, and so on. How have you addressed those challenges? How difficult has it, has it been? Thank you for that question. I would like to tell everybody over there, it has been sunny for two days. You've clearly not been here. Um, and we actually prefer it to rain slightly in the games because we've still got massive venues that we've still got to build in Greenwich Park and on the Mall. Um, yeah, actually, it's just, they, believe it or not, it's the third time that we've hosted the games. Even in 1908, we hosted the games because um, someone else couldn't. Um, so we stepped in. And this, these games are the first time we've actually bid for a game, which is interesting. Um, yes, it's been a challenge. It really has been a challenge. Partly, our comm strategy was based around the fact that the government chose very early on in the process to invest a substantial amount of money into regenerating East London for the future. Uh, so it went... It went on top of the uh, money that we put in the bid that we would require to build the venues. And it has been an ongoing communication. Um, uh, I, I mean, it, is, it has been a challenge, but it's the right thing to do. You know, when you spend a lot of money creating um, a games, creating a regenerated and transformed part of a city, um, people should be asking the questions and we should be answering them. I think the value for money debate will go on for another 10 years. I mean, if you look at Sydney, nobody in Sydney ever talked about legacy. It was never part of anyone's remit in the organising committee. With us, probably over 50% of the people in the organising committee has focused on what is the legacy, how will we amortise the value over the period of time. And I think the best thing you, we can do, and it's kind of what we've done, um, but always up for other suggestions if people have got them, is to just keep telling people what the value is. So we do monitor and we communicate jobs, 
skills. We communicate the fact that, you know, 120 sporting events have been um, held here and that we've won some, you know, great other sporting events. Um, and the legacy, I mean, if you look at the Olympic Park, um, we've got out of the 10 venues, eight of them already have a long-term legacy uh, partner and plan, which, again, Athens, Sydney, Beijing uh, didn't happen. I mean, Beijing put out their tender a year after the Games to look at the legacy. Um, Sydney Olympic Park, um, 10 years on, has actually become a great success, but it has taken a while. So legacy and value for money has been at the very forefront, and it always was. When we went into the bid, one of the things that we did was talk about a sustainable games and we are you know 70 percent of our venues don't uh, aren't in the olympic park they are existing venues within london so we were already on to a sort of very sustainable um and uh, austere if you like path because we truly believe that the games cannot get bigger and bigger and bigger people need to take a stand and people need to do things differently and we did so five of our venues are in the park the massive investment in that park has been really around regenerating that for the future um and uh, that's been terrific and it you know the endorsement of great brands like Westfield and the great shopping centre that um, we now have on the edge of that park, the homes, the housing, the schools uh, will really see in 10 years time, we should all stand back and look at uh, what has, you know, how sport has really been the catalyst for that. Thanks for that. I'm going to another question. Uh, Tim Markline, W2O Group. Given all of the analysis that you've been doing in, in traditional media and social media, I'm curious what you've seen that, that's common either in terms of the themes or, or the impact uh, of traditional media versus social media and what things have been distinctly different? Um, probably the most fascinating thing for us is the impact of social media on traditional media. So, I mean, we only go, when we go back to the launch of our logo, which I'm sure many of you will remember, um, where uh, we ended up, I think, it was a, I think it was a world story for about two days, leading story in the world. Um, and someone set up a site that said, I hate this logo, and 40,000 people signed up to it. And for five days, the traditional media ran stories, some of them on the front page, about this sort of growing, you know, mass hatred of the, of the logo. In a country where you have 60 million people, 40,000 really is a, uh, you know, relatively small part of it. But it led, the, I mean, it was the social media and the signing up that led the way. We found that through ticketing as well. Um, actually, I, to finish the logo story, I should say that the person who set up the site is a massive sports fan when he saw the impact of his site on what was becoming a sort of national and world story um, he did very kindly uh, take the site down um, but the same with ticketing a lot of the noise I think the media particularly traditional media can get very very quickly and very easily through social media a lot of People, a lot of um, naysayers often, Twitter is full of, uh, of, nays of naysayers, um, but also they start to take their guidance, traditional media, on what people are saying on social media. And I think that's been a fascinating um, exercise because it's only really been in the last four years that we're seeing the impact on traditional media that Twitter's having. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we need to, um, unfortunately, come to a close with our questions now. I suspect we could go on for some considerable time. What I'd like to do on behalf of um, delegates is to, um, Jackie, wish you and your team um, a great success with the 2012 London Olympic and Paralympic Games. Thank you for your time. No.